two topics that are, you know, one more related than the other to microalgal culture. When we do the workshop in Milford, my colleagues, uh, Shannon Misik and Judy Etchin Lee, do these, um, do these presentations, and they do a much better job than I will, but um, they couldn't come <laughs> this week, so I'm gonna do the best I can. The, the two topics are um, chemical ecology of microalgal culture systems, uh, and the other one is the um, phytoplankton ecology of growing areas, or use of natural plankton by shellfish, because, you know, as we, discussed yesterday, you were, with your clams especially, you're gonna have them a very short time on cultured algae, and they're gonna spend most of their lives out to pasture. And um, you know, the um, quality and quantity of um, available food in that pasture is something that's pretty important, and finding a good place for grow out is, um, is something we do by trial and error, but there's actually some science that can, can help with that. So first though, we'll talk about chemical ecology of, uh, of algal culture systems. And um, the first part of this has to do with pH, which yesterday I told you the most important thing you can own in, in a hatchery for your algal culture um, portion of what you do is a pH meter, and I hope this helps, helps explain that. So Shannon starts by introducing uh, light and nutrients and all the other things that um, that can affect growth by way of um, you know, by way of, of um, water chemistry uh, you know between nutrients and uh, and bacteria um, and then there's a bit of you know great information at the end of the presentation about um, how having contaminated uh, feeding contaminated culture to uh, an example of base gallop that we were working on uh, for a while. So here we go. This is, I think, one of my favorite of Shannon's projects. And, you know, I was involved in it quite a bit and it was really fun to, to spin this up. But the idea was to, you know, work with um, one of our high lipid tetrasalmus strains, tetrasalmus chewy. PLY429, and um, I mentioned yesterday about the, the greenhouse project to, to try to minimize the, the cost by eliminating, if we can, artificial light from the culture environment. And the, the downside of that is um, over the course of a day, the available light changes quite a lot, and it changes from day to night, and it changes to whether the, um, it's a cloudy day or a cloudy week um, versus, you know, bright sunshine. So because there's a stoichiometry between photosynthesis and carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater to make carbonic acid, um, pH and light are very closely tied to each other. So um, we did a study to... Um, determined two things. One had to do with light and the other had to do with uh, nutrient uptake. And they'll, I'll tell you in a minute why, why that's important. But this was the best um, part of this experiment was designing it. And what we did was to make a grid of day length. So 24 hour light, 16 hours of light, eight of darkness, 12, 12, and eight hours of light and 16 of darkness and um, at different intensities. And what Shannon did was to consider photons of light as a chemical reactant here. So the amount, the number of photons is what's in these, these blocks. And um, what we've been able to do with this experimental design is have um, 24 hour light that's very dim, producing 6.3 units of photons, whatever it is, you know, megamoles per square meter per day or something, have um, a shorter day with the same amount, and then have um, a very short day with very bright light, giving the cultures 
the same amount of light per day, but distributed as, you know, um, dim light all day and very short, very bright day. So this allows us to separate the quantity of light per day from its distribution over the course of the day. So what we found for, you know, this is um, showing the um, division rate and final cell numbers in all the different blocks. And I, I'm gonna mainly like concentrate on the um, this 6.3 units. And what you can see, the division rates at um, 24 hour light, uh, dim light, you know, a 16, eight hour day, um, and final cell numbers are statistically the same, whereas um, we have a difference um, with the uh, very short, very bright day, and it's less growth and lower cell numbers in a very short, very bright day. Um, the cell quota of nitrogen, how much nitrogen is in the cells, was the same for these two treatments also, but statistically higher in the very bright, very short day. And I mentioned yesterday that algae continue to um, take up nutrients, to take up nitrogen um, in the dark. So this is showing uh, luxury consumption of nitrogen. So they keep taking up nitrogen, but they, even though they have the same amount of light, it's not distributed in the day in a way that allows them to turn the nitrogen they took up during the, the long dark night into new cells. So there's something about you know, day length and distribution of, of light in that day that is important to, um, to the performance of the cultures. Because you really want to be, um, you want to be here. You want to have high division rates, high final cell numbers, uh, and you don't want extra nitrogen in the cells for, for good nutrition. So this is a, a little bit of a, a complicated graph, but it allows you to see um, kind of uh, the light saturation here at um, this number of, of light units. And remember we're at 6.3, you know, where, where there's a lot of variation here. And so, you know, there's an equation that you can derive that describes this relationship and actually allows you to, um, to, to be somewhere on this light saturation curve where you have, have, the best, have the best performance of the culture. And you know, Shannon has put this in, into a kind of model that lets us determine when the day length is too short for us to get um, you know, complete um, use of the nitrogen that the cells can take up in, in a day. So you know, here's our conclusions, <clears throat> even though total, total daily length uh, length, uh, light were the same when the photo period was only eight hours. There's a decrease in division rates, final cell numbers, cell quota, nitrate and phosphate is up, which means they're not using it to make new cells. And um, so eight hours of light for PLY429 is not enough, not long enough day. Even if you give enough total light, it's not a long enough day for them to use that effectively. So um, I understand you probably don't have such short days down here, <laughs> but you know, it's kind of, if you're using artificial lights and you know, you want to know how long to keep them on, there's actually science that can help, help you determine how long a, a, you know, is a good day length. I know you guys are using 12 and 12 and, and if that's working for you, it should work for PLY429 because you're, you're not, you don't have a, a decrease in, in uh, performance at anything, you know, longer than eight, once you're, as long as you're longer than eight hours, you seem to be okay. Yeah. When you, when you turn the light, mm -hmm. the light when you do exactly your flat photodioreactor, uh, right, is uh, it better? Actually, no, this, this experiment was done in, uh, in smaller tanks. And, and, you know, what we were doing is, um, honestly, physically moving uh, covers in the greenhouse, putting covers on to, to make it dark. And then we had lights, uh, artificial lights to make 24 hours. So what I'm saying is that when you, when you put eight hour 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's right. Mm -hmm. So my question is that we, we, if you mix it, it becomes faster. So no, no, no. Again, this this was not in the twenty thousand liter. We 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 didn't have you know sixteen twenty thousand liter. <laughs> tanks to do this and right you know this was done in small smaller tanks that could have been part of it and you know nowadays we have a, a fire fluorometer and we can we can know that and when we did this experiment we didn't have that technology one of the reasons we acquired that technology to be able to you know measure um, the um, photo inhibition and uh, you know, light dependent and non-light dependent. So, but yeah, I wish we had that technology when we did this, but we didn't. But you know, from a practical standpoint, again, it's just a, for us guys in the Northern latitudes, you know, if people are using um, natural light in a greenhouse in January, we know that they have to add hours to get POI 429 to grow, no matter how bright it is. Oh yeah, yeah. We got for um, the second half of December and most of January, we have less than eight hours of light at our latitude. So, so Gary, yep. what's the problem of having twenty-four hours? Of light? There was no no problem of having twenty-four hours of light. Yeah. Um, right, that's it. Yep. I have a question yep. for the time of the, the, the period. Of, do you think that's why we have any research done is related to the nutrition for the liquid or for the science of the relationship? Yeah, I think Shannon did C to N. And of course, because there's luxury consumption of nitrogen in the, um, the culture with the too short day, the C to N would be way down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she did that, but it was kind of redundant with the nitrogen lux luxury consumption. And, and so C, lower C to N is usually poor in nutrition because there's always too much protein in a way in, in an algal diet. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, oh yeah, and then she has some propaganda here. Um, yeah, so she did some uh, e even some economic analysis. So we need she calculated from this equation. As I said, there's a bunch of things you could do that. Um, every year you need to add about 400 and two and a half hours of light. She's a chemist; she's very precise. Um, um, to get to half saturation, you need 721 and a half hours of light added. And then she went to the uh, the economic part, you know, figuring out. Well, we know we me had measured how much energy our, our lights take. Um, so, uh, you know, in a lab, um, it would cost us to in our lab it would cost us about seven thousand dollars in light to just optimize the culture during the the darkest days of the year. And if we if we didn't do that, we would save. Um, 85% by avoiding those months in, in annual production costs in our greenhouse. So that's like, you know, that's a lot of good information uh, to use when, you know, when a, a hatchery is trying to decide when to start their spawning and when to start feeding and that kind of stuff. So again, you know, kind of really good practical. Yeah. Those are sodium vapor and yeah, I mean, you know, there are street lights, <laughs> and they're and they're strong in red because uh, in winter we get a lot of blue light. It's not much direct sun. The sun just goes across the horizon like that, and there's you know most of the light that comes straight down is blue. 
So um, section Shannon has on um, carbonate chemistry and photosynthesis and pH. Um, so this is something that I, I kind of glossed over, but um, yesterday. But what, we, what she's showing is uh, carbon dioxide um, dissolving to um, bicarbonate and protons, so that causes um, acidification of the water and uh, further can break down to uh, carbonate and uh, two protons, so you know, further um, acidification. What photosynthesis does is assimilate carbon dioxide, right, as bicarbonate or from carbon dioxide, and that drives the reaction this way, and so this is acid on this end, so phytoplankton production um, drives the pH up. Um, in our small cultures, we use a buffer to, um, to try to maintain the, uh, the pH, but in large outside cultures, it's not cost effective. Um, so is there a less expensive way to control pH? And I think probably a number of you are already doing some of the things that we'll talk about. So um, Shannon did a, an excruciating experiment where she by hand um, tried to maintain pH by adding carbon dioxide. And you know the first thing you can see is she was um, somewhat successful. <laughs> and um, when she failed, the, um, the pH rose in, in the supposedly controlled culture up right to where the, um, the non-controlled culture. And you see the non-controlled ones that is running up above 9.5, almost to 10 by the end. Uh, and where she was controlling it effectively was keeping it around eight. So, you know, one message is like trying to do this by hand is, is actually not terribly effective because if you just miss it a little bit, um, it, it goes, goes out of control on you. Um, the, for me, like the really interesting finding is here is um, you could look at nitrogen assimilation by the uh, both cultures. And you see it's not different between controlled or, um, or uncontrolled particularly. And uh, you know, these cultures do grow, they do assimilate nitrate, but the phosphate in, uh, in solution disappeared as soon as she lost control of the pH. In, uh, and, and it was you know, gone in, in the other one right away. And so she you know, did some looking in the chemical literature and you know, discovered that this is actually a pretty well, um, well described phenomenon. And so you get at, at low pH, you get iron phosphate precipitating as a crystal, but at high pH, you get calcium phosphate. Seawater has a lot of calcium. There's, there's a ton of calcium in, in seawater. And so as the pH goes up, you wind up with um, calcium phosphate precipitating as crystals, taking phosphate out of solution and out of availability to the algae. So, you know, yesterday, I, try to convince you that at high pH, um, you start to lose bicarbonate, which is the main form of carbon that, that algae access from the water. Um, the, the second bad thing that happens is the phosphate disappears. You know, and there's a bit of good news is um, she did find that the phosphate redissolves if you bring the pH back down again. So it's not gone forever. Uh, and that's not the case with iron phosphorus, actually. That is very hard to, to redissolve. So, you know, you don't want the pH, but the, the iron phosphate doesn't precipitate until you're down around five, and it's, it's almost impossible to get an algal culture down there in seawater. So, you know, the real stress on an algal culture at high pH is um, poor availability of carbon, poor availability of phosphorus, both. So, you know, those of you who are just kind of letting your cultures go on a, on a sunny afternoon, um, they're, you're starving them for, uh, for carbon and for, and, and for phosphorus, two things. So that's, you know, kind of not, not great. Um, yeah, so here's a kind of summary slide on that. Uh, at high pH, you get low, uh, lower cell densities, and they're both carbon and phosphorus um, starved. Um, so the solution that, that we had in our big tanks was to bubble in pure carbon dioxide and to control that with, um, with a pH probe that would turn on the carbon dioxide flow 
when the pH rose above some number, and we experimentally tried a lot of different numbers. There's a, lot, a lag, is it takes a while for the carbon dioxide bubbles to dissolve and for that to get mixed in the entire tank and so on, but it is you know, kind of the most effective way of doing that. Um, so again, have a pH meter. If your pHs are up in the nine range, um, either add carbon dioxide or increase the surface to volume ratio. So in a big flat tank, you can decrease the volume so that more carbon dioxide can get in. Um, and then the, the last thing that Shannon um, you know, presents to, uh, to the workshops has to do with um, algal contaminants in algal cultures. And again, this morning you all got to look in microscopes and look at pure cultures of algae, but um, when you look at your production cultures, sometimes you get a terrible surprise of something you didn't expect to see. So um, in, in our, one of the problems in our big algal tanks in our greenhouse was um, cyanobacterial contaminants. And they um, were coming from bird turds and from insects. And you know, by uh, putting finer screening on all the, um, the inflows, the, uh, you know, we have a, a big fan there. The other side was wide open. And now we have a fence and, um, and a metal grate there to keep the birds out. Not, and the bigger insects also. So, you know, that, but, but anyway, we thought, well, you know, how bad can it be, actually? We know cyanobacteria, not good nutrition, but um, should, should we feed the culture anyway? And, and this was like a direct question from a, a workshop participant many years ago. Well, what if I get a contaminant, an algal contaminant? Isn't it better to feed it that than nothing at all? So um, we did an experiment about that. And um, again, Shannon being a chemist was paying attention to pH. And one, one of the equations she derived from, um, from these data is, is also a um, growth and pH relationship. And so this is, um, you know, at less than eight, the algal we're trying to grow, the PLY429, has its optimal growth. Um, and what we don't know is what the uh, cyanobacterial relationship with pH is in terms of growth. So we thought, well, if, if those are substantially different, by controlling pH, we can discourage the cyanobacterial contaminant. So it was a, an attempt to, uh, to solve it, solve the problem with this. So she derived the same equation for um, the cyanobacterium. And here you see its optimum is in the basic range, sort of 8.3-ish. And remember, the tetracelmus is down here. It might be another figure. Uh, okay, well, here's uh, division rates of the cyanobacteria over, um, over the, the pH range. And <clears throat> these figures, I, I, as I recall, <laughs> are made to help us uh, make this relationship. So um, nitrate requirements are very similar, so we can't control the cyanobacterium by, um, by changing the, the nutrients. Um, phosphate requirements um, for... PLY429 are much higher per cell, but then you know we realized that actually the um, if we do it by a per cell basis, it's not a fair comparison because um, in terms of biovolume, um, one tetracelma cell is equal to 125 cyanobacterial cells. So if we remade those figures um, using biovolume instead of um, instead of per cell, what we found is that the um, requirement of the cyanobacterium for uh, phosphate was much higher. And so, you know, as I said, it's, it's kind of weird because at higher pH, phosphate becomes less available, but tetracelmus doesn't perform as well. So it's like we're not thinking we had really found a good control mechanism, but there kind of is a silver lining to, um, to like this, this thing that didn't work as well as we'd like it to. Uh, and that is by reducing the pH, we can actually increase the race, the race between um, the algal we're trying to grow and, and our common uh, contaminant. Um, you know, nevertheless, it's probably not going to, um, not going to solve the problem. So we went back to the question of, well, let's say we get, um, you know, cyanobacterial or other um, poor, nu nutritionally poor contaminants in the culture, is it worth feeding anyway? 
So we use the, the feeding chamber system that I described yesterday, um, some very small base gallops in this, um, in this particular experiment. And <clears throat> we fed them on um, the PLY-429, a mix of PLY-429 and the cyanobacterium and just the cyanobacterium. As you see, we get um, you know, very poor survival on the cyanobacterium. Um, the ones that survive do, do grow a bit. And the mix is kind of intermediate uh, in terms of, of growth, up to eight weeks. And you know, I don't know what timing you guys have to restart a, a culture, but this is kind of good news in a way. Is, is you, For two to three weeks, you don't have a hit on survival, and you, know, you don't have a very big difference in growth. So, you know, the choice that we told the person who asked us, you know, like if you can, you know, reestablish another tank in like two to three to four weeks, keep feeding, it's better than starving them. So here's the conclusions, right? The, on the pH stuff, um, growing PLY429 at a low pH is, is good. Uh, and if we can keep below, um, below kind of 7.5, we're going to inhibit the cyanobacterium. Um, cyanobacteria require more nutrients um, when normalized to biovolume, so we can actually starve them for nutrients and maybe give the um, give PLY429 a, a boost. And um, growing in this low, very low pH range may help us uh, eliminate um, the cyanobacteria by, by a couple of, of different um, you know, background reasons. And then, um, so controlling pH is something you really wanna do if you can. And um, biological contamination changes um, what you may want to do in terms of nutrient enrichment. And that's the, uh, the chemistry part, as best as I can do. Uh, 